naturally you could keep making uh, examples like this. For example, consider like someone's diet and whether they um, smoke or not or, or exercise. I wonder you could say, well, those are totally life choices. You know, how much I eat, what I eat, whether I smoke or don't smoke, whether I exercise or don't exercise. But of course, if I, you know, get unhealthy, that impacts, you know, my ability to work, which impacts my employer. It also impacts, you know, my health, which affects, you know, the cost of medical care for me, which affects the cost of insurance for people. And so there is the challenge of sorting out how much this impacts other people. And this was an area for, you know, hopefully serious debates about what sort of things do affect other people and how much it, of it is their business. And again, this can range from cases in which people look at, say, the harm done by offensive language, threatening language, language that may challenge people, uh, to actions that may not seem to directly harm other people, but inflict costs on other people. Again, like being without insurance, engaging in un unhealthy you know, behavior, uh, etc. And so even if we do accept the principle of harm, we do have to sort out that problem of, the, of these you know, limits of harm. And Mill was well aware of this, and he does try to work this, this problem out. Now, Mill next moves on to the limits of these liberties. So the basic idea is that for people who are like kind of in command of their faculties, etc., and capable, they must be free as long as they're not harming others. The first limit he puts is this. He says his doctrine applies only to humans with mature f faculties. So children would be excluded and people like adults who are not mentally competent will be excluded. Now in the face of it, this seems reasonable. So for example, we may think that adults should be allowed to consume as much say pornography and heroin as they wish as long as they're not hurting others, but we probably don't want children doing that because you know, children uh, have yet to hit a state where they can make better decisions. But then again, if an adult is making consistently bad decisions, we might say, well, they can't make good decisions either. So I guess in part being adult means you're supposed to know better, but then you don't. But anyways, so that part seems kind of reasonable, namely the people that lack the capacity because of, you know, age or mental competence to make decisions, their liberty can be justly restricted. Next, he gets rather British. He says it can be limited in the case of barbarians. So backward states of society where the race may be considered as immature are excluded. Uh, yes, which is as racist as it sounds. Now, he says that in such a scenario, a ruler full of the spirit of improvement can use any expedience to obtain the end. What's the end? Well, the end in this case is to essentially advance civilization. So Mill is also very British in kind of his, his express view of bringing civilization to the world. And so you have this mix of sort of like, you know, clearly racism in the sense that, uh, you know, places where people are immature are excluded, but then also this desire to have everybody ultimately be free. And he claims that liberty as a principle has no application to a state before people can be improved by free and equal discussion. But once a people can be guided to improvement by conviction or persuasion, compulsion is no longer admissible and is justified only for the security of others. So he puts in an exception for cases which he regards as, I guess, inferior societies where they can be compelled, where, but only when the end is, you know, good. Uh, and Mill is... You know, he doesn't mean that just like pretending to be good, but actually aiming towards the good. And this, is, of course, is pretty problematic because it would seem to justify you know, quite a bit of imperialism. Now, interestingly enough, the United States also adopted kind of a similar view when we took over um, Iraq. And we essentially what we said to them was you can have this back when you can run it yourself, which is kind of an echo of Mill's view. So this one is certainly problematic. And it does underlie, this idea does certainly underlie a lot of uh, British and later American foreign policy and view of, view of the world, that we are going places to make things better, 
But until people are capable of doing it on their own, we have to kind of run things for them. So what about the foundation of liberty? Well, Mill, of course, is uh, best known for his utilitarianism. And so it's not surprising that the foundation of his moral view of liberty is the principle of utility. So he rejects the idea of an abstract right independent of utility. So what do we appeal to? Well, obviously, you know, he's utilitarian, kind of the utilitarian. So utility is the ultimate appeal for him. So any moral question. And he makes it very broad in the sense he looks at humanity in terms of the permanent interest of humanity as a progressive being. And these interests, humanity as a progressive being, according to him, authorize subjecting individuals to external control only for the actions concerning the interest of others. So his view is essentially this. Why allow liberty? Well, his argument essentially is utilitarian, that if we allow people to do what they wish without hurting others, there'll be more happiness than unhappiness. Now, since he grounds it on utility and not an abstract right of, you know, freedom, this means that if it were shown convincingly that doing the opposite, restricting people's liberty, would create more happiness than unhappiness, then Mill would have to accept that. So on Mill's theory, liberty is very, you know, conditional on utility. Now, he thinks this is true and you know, presumably always true, but it does sort of leave open the possibility that if you could make a solid case that there's more utility in doing the opposite or something different, then it would follow that if you ground rights on and liberty on utility and utility says, you know, this is not what should be done, then if one's utilitarian, you'd have to go with that. So what about interfering with people's liberty? Well, in the case of punishment, Mill claims that if, if a person hurts others, there is a prima facie, first face, case for punishing them. Kind of intuitively, if someone's hurting other people, then it's reasonable, intuitively plausible to punish them for that. So he's considering cases where we could act in ways that would you know, limit people's liberty. In addition to restricting liberty in cases when a person may be justly punished, according to Mill, there are cases when we can justly compel people. These would include, he gives some examples because of their, again, because of the utility, such as giving evidence in a court of justice, bearing a fair share of common defense, or work necessary to the interests of society, uh, performing certain actions of individual beneficence, such as saving another's life, protecting the defenseless, etc. And he says that things that are obviously a person's duty to do, they may be rightfully be made responsible to society for not doing. Now, one, of course, can debate in great, um, to a great extent what sort of things that we can be compelled to do. Uh, some would agree with this completely. Yes, um, if... Uh, you're a witness to a crime or a witness to someone um, serving as their alibi, then you're obligated to provide evidence that you should provide for the common defense, um, to do work necessary for the good of society, to save people's lives, protect the defenseless. Others, of course, would say that any or all of these may be asking too much, that the idea that people should be you know, compelled to provide for common defense or to keep society going or even doing basic things such as saving people's lives or protecting the defenseless, those are asking too much. And you get a, a lot of moral debate about what is it is that we should be compelled to do. Now, what about accountability? Now, there are cases where people can do evil by actions, so kind of active evil, and there are cases where people can do evil by their inaction, kind of a passive evil, by failing to act. So Mill is considering the moral question of when can we hold people accountable? What kind of evil? 
And he says, the general rule, kind of intuitively, if someone does evil actively, then they would be accountable. But what about cases where someone doesn't do evil, they simply don't prevent it. They simply don't act to stop evil. And these would be cases in which, um, you know, to use some concrete examples, someone is um, witnessing a person being attacked and they could do something, you know, they could at the very least say, call the authorities, uh, and they don't. Would they be accountable? If they see someone, uh, you know, drowning in the river and they could, you know, go and help them with little risk to themselves, could they be held, you know, morally accountable for that person's death? And so there are questions about, you know, how how much are going to hold people accountable? Now, part of the debate also focuses, as you might imagine, on how risky it would be. So, for example, if I see someone being attacked and I'm safely in my, my car going by and I've got my cell phone, for me to not even take the effort of calling would seem to be morally wrong. If, however, I see someone being attacked and they're being attacked by like 20 people armed with like assault rifles and, you know, if I don't leap in there to fight 20 people, well-armed people, I would not be held accountable for that because that's expecting too much for anybody who's not like, you know, Batman or Superman. And similarly for, for other cases, you know, depending on the level of risk involved. And kind of our intuitions are, you know, low-risk low, low risk cases, we'd probably say that a person would be wrong not to at least do something. And in high-risk cases, we'd say, well, yes, that's, that's understandable. But of course, there are people who would say, you have no obligation to do anything for anybody, anytime. And we might be inclined to see such person as, well, evil, or perhaps not, see them as heroic individualists, depending on one's view of these matters. Now, what about cases of compelling people to do good? When should we do that? Well, Mill considers these types of scenarios, and sort of one way to judge it is in the following way. If a person is likely to act better if we leave them alone than controlling them, then given his utilitarianism, that's what we should do. So if there was something, um, you know, suppose we were able to, to sort out that, okay, if we made people do this, then people would act worse than if we just left people alone. What would be an example of this? Well, one common argument often made by uh, conservatives uh, is this. We should not raise taxes on the rich to pay for more social services like education, health care, uh, etc., policing, fire protection, and so on. Why? Well, the argument often goes like this. If we start taxing the rich more, what they'll do is they'll respond by giving less to charity. And whatever we'd get from taxing them, we would lose out much more because they would no longer be giving to charity. And so we'd end up, by trying to get more money for social good, the argument goes, we'd end up getting less. And so the argument is, is that rich people would act better if we didn't tax them than if we did tax them. Now, of course, to be consistent, we would have to apply the same argument to, to everyone. So the same should apply to, to all of us, that I guess none of us should be taxed because if we were simply left alone and not taxed, then of course we would graciously give more to pay for all these services. So the problem of funding would be not that people are, are unwilling to give, it's that they're resentful of being taxed and would give so much more if only they weren't taxed. And that's an empirical question. So these do, even though these are moral questions, the question of whether people would act better or not can be broken down to empirical questions. Again, like in the tax case, we could test that. We could look at would people, would we end up getting more for necessary services if we tax people less? And if the answer was yes, if somehow that resulted in a better society, then not compelling people to pay taxes, and if that meant that more people would pay more so we'd have more resources, then that would be the right thing 
to do? And again, this would be an empirical question. Secondly, if the attempt to exercise control would create more evils than it would prevent, then on utilitarian grounds, we shouldn't restrict people's liberties. So, so for example, suppose we consider, say, drug use and sale to be like an, an evil. Now, suppose that uh, attempting to you know, exercise control over people to stop that would actually produce greater evils. So if we had a war on drugs, for example, against uh, marijuana usage, this would end up creating something far worse. In that case, Mill would say, if the attempt to exercise control would produce greater evils than it would prevent, then on utilitarian grounds we shouldn't do that. So he allows for those two exceptions. One, we shouldn't compel people if leaving them alone would be better off, have greater utility, and there could be cases like that. And secondly, if attempting to exercise control over people would produce a greater evil than it would prevent, then it would be the wrong thing to do. We should allow people that liberty, even if they're doing wrong, by allowing them to do it, we're doing less wrong. And again, the um, war on drugs would be a good example of this, because even if we think that you know drugs are wrong, it does seem that our attempt to war on them it created far more harms than the drugs, you know, themselves did in the case of you know marijuana. You could have more debate about you know the harder drugs, but uh, the efforts to control people seem to have created more harm than good. So what about cases where you can't um, enforce this? Well, in cases where we have you know you know cannot enforce uh, responsibility, he claims the conscience of the agent should judge. Mill then turns to our spheres of liberties. Now, for Mill, there are multiple spheres of action where we should be free. Now, according to Mill, the sphere of action, basically our area of life, in which society has the least interest and most indirect interest is the area where a person's mind, your conduct affects only, you know, me or you and only affects others that we associate with free voluntarily and through undeceived consent and participation. So in other words, according to Mill, the stuff that involves just me and people that I'm associating with freely voluntarily without you know coercing them and without deceiving them they have uh, the state should have the least interest and now mill considers the objection which you were considered before whatever affects me might affect others through me you know the example being uh health care for example not having it hurts the people who have to bear the cost of taking care of care of my expenses also if i take poor care of myself if I'm ill then I can harm others another example would be like in the case of um, well we can use the example of the pandemic if I say I've got a freedom to go without wearing a mask without taking precautions to go out and get in people's faces then that of course would be affecting affecting others quite a bit so in those cases we might say that almost anything I do could affect other people and this becomes a matter of considerable debate, namely, how much can what I do affect others, and at what point at which would it be enough to justify interfering with, with my liberty. So for Mill, the first region of liberty is this, what he calls the inward domain of consciousness, the liberty of conscience, a liberty of thought and feeling, and a freedom of opinion and sentiment on all subjects practical, speculative, scientific, moral, theological. We also, he puts in here, the liberty of expressing and publishing opinions. So not just having them, but expressing and publishing them. And he takes um, these to be as important as liberty of thought. And he regards them being based on the same reason. So essentially what he's got here is freedom of thought and freedom of expression. Now, 
In the United States, of course, we have the legal right in the First Amendment to essentially freedom of press, which people take to you know, include freedom of expression. Emil makes this broader. He makes it a moral liberty, and it includes conscience, thought, feeling, uh, expressing, and publishing. So actually a broader feeling. Now, as far as we know, the government does not yet have the power to control our thoughts and feelings directly. I mean, they can do so through propaganda, etc., but we yet to have mind control. So Mill considers this a critical area of liberty.